Okay, Biology B, folks, lesson 1.2, Human Impact on Ecosystems. Some of the things that we need to know when we uh, look at this or in our enduring understandings, ecosystems can change over time due to interactions and interrelationships between abiotic and biotic factors, or both, through the energy flow, cycle of matter, and limiting factors. Okay, if you look at the uh, image here, you can see how humans are altering or changing or influencing a lot of different areas uh, of our ecosystem. So some essential questions that we should be able to answer after the lesson. How do ecosystems change over time? How and why do populations change throughout time? How do we humans and human activity affect ecosystems? How can the diversity of life be understood through evolutionary relationships? How does cycling of matter occur at all levels and how does the flow of energy occur at all levels of biological organization. All right, so students are going to be able to measure and analyze real world data and effectively communicate scientific findings about human impact on an ecosystem. For example, indicators of a system quality, climatographs, age structure diagrams, dead zones. Identify ways that factors, events, for example, pollution, habitat, fragmentation, competition can affect an ecosystem. Explain the resiliency of an ecosystem and how it can recover from a major event. For example, oil spills, deforestation, conservation, areas, natural disasters. Okay, so the picture just goes to show you that we're not individuals, all right? We are simply in an area where we, um, all things are in the, e equally interdependent upon each other in the planet and it's a cyclical thing, all right? So here's some different ways that we can impact the planet. Human survival depends on the health of the ecosystem. An ecosystem is comprised of communities of plants, animals, and other organisms in a particular area that can interact with each other and their surrounding environment. Both living and non-living things are considered part of an ecosystem. Humans threaten the ecosystem by producing waste, damaging habitats, removing too many species without giving the ecosystem time to naturally regenerate. So anytime we have, you know, like a hurricane like Katrina down in New Orleans, or we have an oil spill up in Alaska, the Exxon Valdez oil spill, um, given time, you know, the, the ecosystems tend to try to um, go back to the way they were. And um, if, we, if we allow that to happen, uh, for the most part, it does. Now, once you chop down a forest, um, it's very difficult to have a forest go back to the way it was. Um, so there are ways of it does not recover properly. So what's the root of the population? Well, however, the problem is uh, there's too many people. So if you look at the population picture on the right, you can see for a long period of time, we didn't have many people on the planet. And then as we got to be more modern and we had the ability to keep people healthy from medicine and we had better food and we had better shelter and all that kind of stuff, uh, the population started to explode, right? So you can see if you have a lot of people, those people need things, right? And then we have to start to use the planet to get those things. So you can click on a lot of these links if you open it up the uh, presentation in the actual lesson. Over the past 50 years, humans have changed ecosystems faster and more extensively than any other period in human history. This has been largely uh, due to rapidly growing demands for food, fresh water, timber, fiber, fuel. The result has been a substantial and largely irreversible loss in the diversity of life. Changes made to the ecosystem have contributed to the substantial gains in human well-being and economic development, but these gains have been achieved at growing costs. These costs include the degradation of many ecosystem services. Right, we'll talk about ecosystem services. Increased risks of abrupt changes and increased poverty for some groups of people. These problems, unless addressed, will substantially reduce the benefits that future generations get from the ecosystems. And I think it's our job to make sure that the planet's in a pretty good place for those who follow us. So here's a great example of um, 
things that ecosystems that are not able to recover. So when we chop down rainforest, rainforest will never come back. So um, there's an ecosystem service. They are the lungs of the earth. They provide all kinds of medicines, um, lots of different things that the, the rainforests are necessary for the survival of the planet. So taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere is one of them. That's a big one. So the uh, rainforest here is being chopped down for farmland. The farmland that is going to be um, here in this location will only be good for a few years. And then I got to chop down the rest of that forest and then regrow it for farmland. And then that won't be available. And then there's nothing left. So this degradation in the ecosystem could get significantly worse during the next 50 years. It's a barrier to the achievement of the Millennial Development Goals, which is um, the goals to keep the planet in a good place. Reversing the degradation of ecosystems while meeting increasing demands of their services is a challenge. This challenge can be partially met in the future under scenarios involving significant changes to policies, institutions, and practices. However, these require actions will have to be substantial when compared to actions currently being taken. So everybody on the planet is going to need to play their role. So what are the indicators? An indicator is something that you, helps you understand where you are, which way you are going, and how far you are from where you, need, you want to be. A grade is a good example at midterm. You know? So if you've got a C, then you know where you're at. You need to you know where you want to go if you want to get an A. Enable communities to measure progress towards or away from becoming a green community. So if you look at the um, thing on the uh, right here, right, the figure, if you look at the green, water quality, air quality, natural resources, if you look at the right side, education, health, poverty, and crime, okay, and you look through the middle, stockholder profits, materials for production, and jobs. So the economy, right, and um, the ability for people to have a job and to have some education and the ability to have health helps to reduce poverty and crime. Once we tend to have that under control, then we can do a better job with the water quality, air quality, and natural resource reduction. So we do have to clean things up a little bit. And then all of it's interrelated. So some traditional indicators, per capita income, how much money are you making? Unemployment rate, are there enough jobs to go around? Size of the economy, is it healthy and robust? Environmental indicators, air, water, pollution, average waste per person, fuel use. Social indicators, number of years in school, demographics, population size, age rates. So all these things are going to either put some pressure on the environment or not. Um, you could say that this country, which doesn't have a huge population in comparison to the planet, is using most of the stuff because we have money and we have the ability to buy stuff and we want stuff and we're materialistic. Um, but that puts massive amounts of pressure on all of those environmental indicators, the air, water, pollution, average waste per person, fuel use. Um, so it doesn't mean just because you have money, you're going to be able to, uh, you're in a better place, you know, but just like we are causing some issues, people that don't have a lot of stuff have to go out and chop down those rainforests and do things that are not necessarily great for the environment in order to, you know, get wood to heat their house or, um, you know, get some food. Land conversion, all right? This, what you're looking at is Darby High School's in Heritage Middle School in 1994. It's not there. It was a farm. Guess what? It's not a farm anymore. We only have about 4% of the total planet that is capable of growing food. So if we keep converting that 4% into parking lots, um, we're not going to have any place to grow food. So increase in population in, is, is a perfect way to say that we're going to need more places to build schools and shopping centers and houses and so forth. So that population is causing a reduction in some of this usable land. Some 3,000 acres of produ productive farmland are lost to development each day in this country. Biodiversity, obviously, you're going to change that. In 2000, Dick, there was 1.15 acres of arable farmland per person. By 2000, uh, 2039, there may only be 
about half an acre. Habitat fragmentation. Anytime we're putting in roads and things like that, we're chopping up habitats. So the right and the left where deer might be able to run across now, you know, they're not gonna be able to do it as easy, especially if there's fences up. So it's a process which habitat loss in the division of large continuous habitats into smaller and more isolated remnants. Examples of highways, deforestation, dams, and other in development projects. Introduce exotic species. You're looking at zebra mussels. Zebra mussels were, came over from the Mediterranean as a ship goes across the ocean and it might not be full of cargo. It's coming to this country to fill up. It still needs to be sitting in the water at a certain level. So they fill the vessel with water. So the ship filled its water from the Mediterranean, comes across the United States through the St. Lawrence Seaway, drop, lets go of that water, and then takes on the cargo to allow it to sink into the water again. The problem is that water contained these guys, the zebra mussels, which had no natural predator. And they took over, um, in some ways, they helped clean the water, but they wound up, you know, eating uh, a lot of the food that would be necessary for our own creatures. So it caused all kinds of problems. And uh, now we, we can't get rid of them. So it's how do we live with them? So that's an, what we call an introduced species. Um, we have the emerald ash borer that came over in the wood crates from over in Asia that are killing our ash trees. Um, another example. So inadvertently or deliberately, humans have always carried species from one region to another, ultimately between continents, but the development of rapid means of transportation has greatly increased the frequency of these introductions. Introduced species may outcompete native species and alter ecosystems. Zebra mussels in the Great Lakes, and uh, besides the economic damage, they are competing with our own na native creatures. So exploitation, exploitation of resources, the exploitation of natural resources, a key factor in economic growth and development, but one that can have serious negative environmental, social, economic impacts. You know, people paying large amounts of money to go over to Africa and hunt large game, you know, and they take a picture. Overfishing, we are taking fish out of the ocean way faster than it can replenish itself. Fossil fuel extraction, we don't, you know, it's not a renewable resource and we're using it at a rate in which it might not be around for many more years. And the exotic pet trade, um, if you guys have watched the uh, Netflix series with the exotic Joe and all that stuff with the tigers, you know the story. Food security. The World Food Summit of 1996 defined food security as existing when all people at times have access to sufficient, safe, nutritious food to maintain a healthy, active life. is a complex, sustainable development issue linked to health through malnutrition, but also to sustainable economic development, environmental, and trade. Agriculture remains the largest employment sector in most developing countries, and international agriculture agreements are crucial to a country's food security. Fortunately, we have some pretty good farmland and some pretty good, um, very intelligent farmers um, who know the science of growing food and are getting more food per acre than ever before in a relatively healthy, safe way. So if you look here, that picture on the right certainly is not aesthetically pleasing. It will never grow back like that stand of trees that you see. They'll never grow them back like that if we just plant trees. Um, it would take hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years to look like a forest again. So it's beyond our lifetime, right? Just planting trees, it looks like a tree farm versus a forest. And that estimated 13 million hectares of forest were lost each year between 2000 and 2010 due to deforestation. In tropical rainforest, particularly deforestation, continues to be an urgent environmental issue that jeopardizes people's livelihoods, threatens species, and intensifies global warming. Over the past 50 years, about half the world's original forest cover has been lost, mainly because of the unsystematic use of its resources. When we take away the forest, it's not just the trees that go, the entire ecosystem, so the deer, the um, bear, the fox, it's all those things that are intending to hang out in there and get some shelter. This is um, a regular day, midday, um, 
And you can see that the pollution is making it look like actually, um, you know, there's something going on here, but this is just pollution. So we have all kinds of pollution, water, acid, rain, air, soil, noise, light, radioactive, thermal. You can click on all those links to get an idea, okay, what they are, but they sound, they are just like late sound. So measuring the health of an ecosystem and biomes. We use climate graphs, age structure diagrams, and dead zones. So climate graphs. Climate, climate graph is used to show the precipitation and the temperature of a region. Both sets of data are put on the same graph, the bar graph. Along the bottom shows the average monthly precipitation and the top line graph shows the average monthly temperature. By looking at the long-term data, scientists can see if the climate is changing in a particular region. So if you look at the bottom, you go January to December, so that's one year, average temperature, average amount of rainfall. So you can see in this particular uh, graph, the um, average precipitation, you know, gets a little bit more, uh, they get a little more rain per month in April, May, June, July, and August, right? And then it starts to tail off again. Um, in terms of temperature, right, you can see the summer months are warmer than the cooler month, uh, the, uh, you know, the fall and the spring. So you can look at this, this is Columbus, Ohio, and you can take a look at this year after year after year and see if those, the data has changed at all. Very important tool. All right, age structure diagrams. If you look at the three pictures, okay, on the left of each image, right, is the male population. On the right is the female population. The width is the percent of the population that particular age group has of the total population. So, for example, in Kenya, Nigeria, and Saudi Arabia, there's a whole lot of young people and then it gets significantly less as they get older, okay? Significantly less. People are dying at a faster rate. If you look at Australia, Canada, the US, tends to have most, most of the age groups are about the same in terms of the percent of the total population. Um, so there's you know, a similar amount of young kids to middle age, and then obviously they get, start to die off as they get older. Uh, if you look at uh, the one on the right, it's even more so, right? So they have a lot of people, or not as many people, but in the younger age groups, um, but they are about the same as what's in the middle and the upper, okay? So um, pretty typical of a age structure diagrams where you have um, the rapid growth, right? And you look at those countries, they don't have as much money, jobs, education, those types of things. Um, and then you wind up going to a, the middle population uh, growth rate where you have an Austria, Canada, and the United States, pretty good uh, healthcare, pretty good education. And the U.S. will be transitioning over time. This is what's been happening to what you see on the right uh, in the Austria, Denmark, and Italy, uh, where all the age groups. So if you look at, say, ages zero to 14, ages 15 to 44, and ages 45 to 85, having about the same number of people in each of those groups, except for the oldest, the very oldest. Okay, so uh, rapid growth, slow growth, and then zero or negative growth. Many of those countries over in Europe um, are now having less people each year than they did before, less babies, uh, they're not even replacing themselves. In other words, a male and a female, if they have, uh, they get married. If they have two kids, they were going to replace themselves. That's not happening anymore. They're having one, and many of them are not having any kids. So that population over there is crashing. Right? Rapid growth means a country should increase food production, build more schools and homes, plan for more job opportunities, implement birth control, give females more rights, usually agricultural population with problems of overpopulation. So it's very easy to say, this is what you have to do, but if you don't have the money, the industry, the, the ability, uh, it's very difficult to get out of that. 
So the slow growth population, you start to see the, the population in each age group becoming more and more alike. Um, you tend to have a, um, a uh, the birth rate and the death rate tend to slow down and the workout incentives to encourage more births, begin hiring foreign labor, ensure proper medical services. Zero or negative population pyramid means birth rate can equal to or less than death rate. Fine. So if you want your economy to keep going, you need to find people to fill those jobs because there's there aren't that many people anymore. All right. So hypoxic zones are areas in the ocean of such low oxygen concentration that animal life suffocates and dies as a result are sometimes called dead zones one of the largest dead zone forms in the Gulf of Mexico every spring. Each spring as farmers fertilize their lands, preparing for crop season, rain washes off the land and into the streams and rivers. Once that happens, those plants use those fertilizers in the ocean. They grow like crazy and then there's not enough nutrients to support them. They die. Their decomposition causes, is it needs oxygen to decompose them. It sucks up all the oxygen in, in the Gulf and then everything dies. All right, so that's basically all the information there. I just basically wind up having too much nutrients, too many plants. The plants have to die because there's no more nutrients after they use them all up. The decomposition uses all the oxygen in the water and then everything dies. It happens in a lot of different places. Okay, so we have other types of dead zones. So we had a couple of nuclear radiation um, problems and uh, Fukushima from the tidal wave and Chernobyl from the explosion of the uh, nuclear power plant, right? 230 square miles basically where nothing was living. So the ecosystems being resilience. Resilience of an ecosystem as a measure of its ability to absorb changes and still exist. So to deal with our increased um, impact on them, uh, are they able to handle that? Stability, which he defined as the ability to, of a system to return its equilibrium state after a temporary disturbance. So how quickly can the oil area that gets an oil spill return to normal? How quickly can Louisiana and their bios and all that stuff re return after Katrina? Resiliency and stability are two important properties. Ecosystems ability to recover after environmental disturbance, high biodiversity, the more biodiverse, the more likely it will recover. The increase in, uh, or the ability to be very genetically biodiverse, that's another way that will help um, a population recover. The more, the more genetic biodiversity, the better. The time of day, um, not, nocturnal animals burrow during the day. So if something happened at night, a lot of those nocturnal things would still be surviving because they're buried in the ground. And then the time of year. Here's a good look at uh, an ecosystem that has recovered. Uh, if you look at the pictures, it tells you a story. All right, so here you see this big volcano. After the volcano, it basically wiped out everything. In a, and then today, it looks pretty good. It's recovered. It's been a really interesting study for... Uh, scientists that look at succession, how um, an ecosystem can recover. In Chernobyl, Chernobyl this is uh, the nuclear power plant that exploded. This is the city and no one's living there anymore. Chernobyl's ecosystem seemed to bounce, to be bouncing back 19 years after the explosion, but no one's living in those apartments that you see there. This was the Valdez oil spill um, and, you know, a beautiful area up in Alaska was covered in this stuff. And um, in the Jurassic Park film, Jeff Goldblum always says, life finds a way. And um, the ecosystem has cleaned this up. We physically helped clean a little bit of it. Um, you can still go up there and find some oil that is buried underneath the rocks in some places. But for the most part, it is doing it better. Some of the population, as you can see here in the, in the bullet point, 25 years later, it's even further now. Some populations have bounced back. Others are still struggling like herring. And 
that is the end of the lesson.